So Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but let everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. I'm going to read that one more time. Be anxious for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. And you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. You see that? Abounding with thanksgiving. Father, we just thank you tonight for this opportunity to be here, to gather among the saints. Lord, to turn our hearts and our thoughts to you. Lord, to hear from your word, to receive revelation, Lord, and to have you speak into our heart. Lord, that we might be thankful and have a grateful heart, Lord, for this is truly pleasing unto you. And we just glorify you in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. I've titled this message tonight, Thanksgiving, 400 years later. I wonder if you knew tonight that it was 400 years ago, this autumn, this fall, that the Mayflower landed in Massachusetts. And one year after that landing, which was in 1620, in 1621, there was the very first Thanksgiving as we knew it in America. You see, historians trace Thanksgiving to the travel of the Puritans. Of course, we know them also as the pilgrims or the separatists from England. They wanted to come to America. They were fleeing the religious persecution that they suffered there under the Church of England. And they wanted to establish what we would call a city on a hill. And they wanted to do this. Again, this was in around the year 1620. They boarded a ship that we know as the Mayflower, and they traveled across the treacherous Atlantic Ocean to Massachusetts. There were 102 passengers on board. There were 30 crew members. How many of you know that it wasn't exactly a cruise ship that they were traveling on? It was a sailing type ship. They were not prepared for the rough seas and the conditions that they found themselves in. As a result of being 10 weeks at sea, cramped in rooms that were cordoned off to about 1,600 square feet with the ceiling that was about five feet tall with swells of water 100 feet tall crashing over the ship, they traveled to America. The powerful thing is that despite all the storms and all the dangers and the perils that nearly destroyed the ship, only one person died while they were en route. But then there was a woman who was pregnant and she gave birth during one of the storms so that the net number of people who traveled over was the same when they arrived. Now when they docked in Massachusetts, they did have others that passed away while they were in the harbor. There were unsanitary conditions. Again, they were not prepared for the winter and the weather that we uh, experience here in America, especially in the Northeast. When you, you're over in England and you're living over there, you could probably have a, a decent jacket maybe, or, or maybe a sleeveless coat like I have, and that would pretty much suffice all year round. But when you got over to America, how many of you know that there were frigid temperatures that would drop below zero and they didn't have the clothing, they didn't have anything that they needed to be able to handle it. There are diary entries that tell of God's provision and how the native Indians that, uh, that they encountered helped them to survive. 
teaching them how to hunt, teaching them how to plant crops. But with all that they faced, within the first year they were in America, 45 of the 102 passengers died. Most of them were men. And I believe there were 19 women and children who died in that first year as well. But in the fall of 1621, 400 years ago this fall, the pilgrims sat down with the, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of these Indians, this group of Indians, to celebrate their first year and how God had brought them through. Now you may wonder, Brother Robert, how could you possibly celebrate after that many people had passed away in such a short period of time? But you see, there was an attitude of gratitude that was in their heart. And they reached out to God with thanksgiving, even despite of all that they had gone through. I was standing in line at a checkout just this afternoon, and I was just overhearing one of the gentlemen talking to the cashier and how that he had said that he knew 10 people so far who had passed away from COVID. And I thought, I thought I knew a lot of people. I knew seven people. He knew 10 people. How many of you know that we are living in perilous times? We're living in difficult times. We're living in times that are very similar to what these folks experienced. There was death, there was carnage, there was all kinds of things that, all kinds of reasons that we could say, well, we're not going to be thankful, we're not going to have an attitude of gratitude, but that was not at all the way that the pilgrims and those that traveled over felt. You see, for hundreds of years, Thanksgiving has been celebrated at different dates starting in 1621. But in 1863, Abraham Lincoln, in the middle of the Civil War, mind you, another traumatic situation. I don't know if you've ever studied the Civil War, but I can't even imagine how horrific that must have been. But during the Civil War, 1863, Abraham Lincoln proclaimed Thanksgiving Day to be held in each November going forward. And since that time, we have celebrated it in November. And then, of course, the date was eventually sent to what it is today. You see, Thanksgiving is a means of celebrating God's goodness, and it has been such in this nation for over 400 years. If you read the diary entries, and I was reading some of, some of these things before when I was studying for this message, you would be shocked at the ways in which God provided for those pilgrims when they came. All of it they saw as divine providence. They came upon this stash. I guess they, I don't know if they were just digging or what had happened, but they came upon this stash of corn and some other goods that they could use for seeds so that they could plant crops and things that had been left behind, presumably by Indians. And all of it they saw as God's provision uh, for their needs. But modern historians, how many of you know what I'm talking about tonight? Modern historians and politicians are working overtime to try to rewrite American history. They are trying to write God completely out of the story. They clearly hate God and they clearly, in many cases, hate America. And they're trying to strip away all of our reasons for being thankful to the Lord. And I believe that we need to maintain, we need to stand up and make sure that our children know what the truth is about how our nation was founded. Our nation was founded upon people trying to come to a place where they could worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. But the spirit of Antichrist is at work. They're trying to get people to hate this nation. They're trying to get people to hate the fact that we were a Christian nation and many other things. So kids aren't even being taught the basics anymore. As a matter of fact, they're trying to teach a completely different version of history than what we have. And when they do admit that these things are true, it is grudgingly. They will always have some kind of snide remark to add in at the end so that to discount the truth of it. But how many of you know we need to be thankful that we live in this nation? We are blessed in ways we can't even imagine. 
But how many of you know, when you lose the attitude of thanksgiving, when you lose that attitude of gratitude, you can become cynical to where you don't see the good in anything. You see, so much of it deals with a right reference point, okay, in how we are living. What is our reference point? Well, if you grow up in America and you only know America, you don't know anything else, it would be very easy to not understand how you have a, have a lot of things other people in the world do not have. We are very blessed. I mean, even the poorest people in America are living pretty good. I mean, you see homeless folks that are eating McDonald's. A lot of people in the world, by the millions, don't even have clean running water. They do not have toilets like we have. I could just go on and on and on. They don't have a means of keeping their meats and things cold or frozen so that they're fresh. So they have all kinds of issues with getting sick when they eat. And it's just on and on and on. We are just blessed. So if you wake up in, in the morning, okay, you have a reason to praise the Lord and to be thankful to God. Did you know in the book of Romans chapter 1, and I'm not going to turn over there, but this has gone on in my mind over and over since I was studying. In, the, in Romans chapter 1, one of the things that Paul indicates as sort of the pathway to where you are really drifting away from God is that you're not thankful. You're not thankful. Show me a person that's thankful and I will show you a person that's usually happy and joyful. You show me a person that's grateful and I'll show you someone that's happy. I remember in the home church, one of the most moving testimonies I've ever heard, probably the most moving testimony I've ever heard, is we had some homeless gentlemen that we had picked up. We used to have homeless ministry and, and it had kind of came and went over the years. But there was, a, there was a gentleman who came into the service. The pastor gave an opportunity for people to come up and to, to testify. And I'll never forget this man just standing talking about how he was just so thankful. Now I'm looking at him thinking, here's a homeless man. Here's a man who doesn't have anything to his name. He probably doesn't even know where his next meal is coming from. But he just stood and talked about he was so thankful. And he said it with such conviction that every time he said it, it was like it pushed me even farther down into my seat. And it made me stop and reevaluate my whole life. Because I thought, here's a man who is living like this, but yet he is thankful. He has a grateful heart, okay? And that is such a powerful thing. In Lamentations chapter 3, and I think I'm just going to turn over there real quick. And I just want to really quickly show you something here. I always tell people that no matter how you are going in life, the reference point that you need to look at in order to keep everything in perspective, is the book of Lamentations, chapter 3. And I just want to see if I can turn over here for just a minute. I'm, I'm going to start at verse 18. I could read the entire chapter, but I'm, I'm not going to take the time to do that. Maybe you can do that maybe this week. Lamentations, chapter number 3, verse 18 and following. And I said, this is Jeremiah, My strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. He's talking about all the terrible things he had been through, all of the horrible things that had happened. And I think about that being the case with the prophets. I think of it being like Paul. You know, Paul said that he had lost everything for the cause of Christ, but yet he talked about rejoicing. I think about him being beaten on his back. I think about all the times he had been stoned, all the times that terrible things that had happened. Undoubtedly, his whole family had abandoned him because of his stand for Christ. But nevertheless, he would talk about rejoicing. He would talk about being thankful over and over again. And here is Jeremiah. He said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my roaming. The wormwood and the gall. Of course, wormwood is poison. My soul still remembers and it sinks within me. But he said, watch this. But this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. What is that, Jeremiah? What is your hope? 
What is it that you recall to your mind when it seems like everything is going wrong? Verse 22. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Think of that. It is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You see, saints, if we got what we really deserved, if we got what was really coming to us, none of us would be here tonight. Our sins would have us cast into a devil's hell for all of eternity. But the Lord came into the world. He died on the cross for our sins to make it possible for us to live for eternity with him. And you see, when Jeremiah would reflect upon all of the terrible things that were going around him, all of the horrible things that were happening, he was thinking about how everything seemed to be just falling apart. But then he focused his mind back to this one fact, that it is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions do not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You see, God is a good God, and God loves us. God has blessed us. He's provided salvation for us, and there are so many things that we could say about that. But that needs to be our reference point. Jesus came into the world. Jesus died for our sins. He's already made a way for salvation so that the worst thing that could possibly happen to us has been averted. It has been avoided. We can come into the presence of the Lord. We can know his face once again. These things are all possible. And if we never ate another meal, if we never had another good day the rest of our life, we have something to praise God about because for eternity, we're going to spend it with the Lord. Think of where you could be right now apart from the grace of God. Where would you be? Where could you be? Have you ever thought of it? I've talked to my wife many times about it, and occasionally I will say something like, if I'd have never turned to the Lord, if I were in this circumstance right now, it would be a very different outcome. But the Lord has gotten a hold of us. He's gotten a hold of our heart. I think back of all the things that I have to be thankful for, saints, and I'm not going to wear you out with them. But I will tell you, I was thankful the day that the Lord saved me. I was thankful the day that I realized that I was truly forgiven of my sins and that I could move forward in God and do what he wanted me to do. I was thankful the day that my dad quit drinking after 25 years of alcoholism. He quit smoking as well and he got saved. I never thought my dad would be saved. I was thankful the day that my mom gave her life to the Lord. I was grateful when that happened. I was grateful the day that my father-in-law gave his life to the Lord after having been away from God his whole entire life. You see, he came to church as a young person, but he got away from God. I'm thankful that my mother-in-law gave her life to the Lord and, serving, and was serving God when she died. And she continued on serving God. I could go on and on and on. As the song says, and we've, we've talked about it before, count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it may surprise you what the Lord has done. You know, the devil wants us to focus on the negative. He wants us to focus upon everything we don't have. He wants us to focus upon everything that's going wrong. But if we could keep our eyes focused on what God has done and what he is doing. He set us free from sin. Aren't you grateful that you're not bound up in sin tonight? Did you know that we could all be alcoholics? We could all be drug addicts. We all could be out in sin and living a horrible life. And I'm not saying we're better than anyone else. I'm not like the one who thanks God he's not like the other. I'm just saying that God has been good to us. And we need to be thankful. When you think about all that Christ has done, the only reasonable thing to do 
is to give your life to Christ and to serve him. That's the only reasonable thing to do. I don't know. I have a lot to be thankful for, saints. I have so much to be thankful for. I don't have time to sit and dwell on the negative because God's got a plan. God's been faithful all these years. Why would he quit being faithful now? He's not going to quit being faithful. I thank God that my wife is still sitting here just about six rows back in the seat. I was given a, given a diagnosis 21 years ago. Your wife's got congestive heart failure. Her heart's at about 50% of what it should be. I said, what's that mean, doc? He said, I'll tell you what it means. If she needed to, she couldn't even go out and mow the lawn right now. That's how bad her heart is. She couldn't even do it. But she is still here. God's brought her through cancer on two occasions. But I'm thankful that she's here. I'm thankful that my sons, even though they grew up having terrible, fatal asthmatics with asthma so bad, I put their lips blue, not able to breathe with asthma attacks. I, I put them in the ambulance to go to the hospital, but they're still around. And one of them was behind this pulpit just last Sunday. And I thank God. Praise God. I can praise God for that. How many of you know we have something to be thankful for? God is good. And I am thankful for Hillcrest Bible Church. I am thankful for God moving. I'm thankful for every one of you. You know, God has done so many things here in this church. He's healed so many people. And uh, he has done so many great things. And I look forward to the future. God is such a good God. I just wonder if we could sing that chorus.